Hello, 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 and welcome. This video is for you. If you are ready to find out what the grace of God looks like on the life of a believer, what the divine empowerment, the power of God, what it looks like, the ability for you to overcome, the ability for you to walk in destiny, what that looks like on the life of a believer. This video is for you. Stay until the end. It will bless you mightily. My name is Shaitria Jones and I help powerful Christian women take what they've learned from the Bible and apply it to their everyday lives. And so today we are talking about what God's grace looks like on the life of a believer. Now, often as believers, when we hear, oh, it was but by his grace, um, the first place we go to is that he has given us something that we don't deserve. So it was through God's grace, through faith, that we are saved. Because um, God's grace gave us the blood of Jesus and the blood of Jesus redeemed us from our sins and allowed us to be in right relationship with God, um, we got what we didn't deserve. So that is God's grace um, at the basic level. But I want to talk about God's grace at the next level because we often live in the place of just the grace of God giving us what we don't deserve. But the grace of God is more than that. And because we serve a multidimensional, multifaceted God, we have to understand that the things of God are multi-layered. Because see, those holy angels that are flying round about him saying, holy, 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 they're saying that because they're seeing a new side of the holy God. And so we're going to look at God's grace. Um, and from this perspective, we're looking at God's grace as his divine empowerment on our lives. So the ability of God working through us. I'm going to say that again. We're going to look at God's grace as his divine empowerment on our lives. It is his ability working through us. Did you know that God's ability works through you? When you are yielded to the Holy Spirit, you give the spirit of grace the ability to manifest in your life and shoulder burdens that you cannot carry by yourself. I'm talking about how to apply the grace of God to your life because that's what I help believers do. We're going to look at some real life examples of the empowerment of God on the life of a believer because... Um, when we really allow the, the Spirit of God to live in us and through us, it will change our lives and then it will change the lives of those that we are connected to. So if you have not yet grabbed your paper, I'm going to need you to do that. Grab your paper, grab a pen, and grab onto your seats because God is about to show up today. Okay, so... What is God's grace? God's grace is the divine, the divine empowerment of God. The ability to do with God what you cannot do without God. Okay? Well, we're going to take a look at Ezekiel 36 and 27. So that is my first scripture. Ezekiel 36, 27. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you shall keep my judgments and do them. Ezekiel 36, 27. So the Spirit of the Lord is talking to Ezekiel and he's talking about the children of Israel and how they're to be set apart for him. Um, and uh, they have been sinning and sinning. And so like, how are they going to do this? And so God is answering and saying, I'm going to put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes that you can keep my judgments and do them. So without the spirit of God, we don't have the ability to follow the will of God because we're full of ourselves. We have to be emptied out in order to walk in the things of God. So Ezekiel 36, 27 says, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you should keep my judgments and do them. We're talking about uh, what God's grace looks like on the life of a believer and it is his divine empowerment the ability to do with God what you cannot do without him um, my second scripture that I want us to take a look at is Ephesians 3 16 that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man 
Ephesians 3, 16. So the, the spirit of grace is a spirit that strengthens you. It's a spirit that builds you up. The reason why you have the ability to endure is because of the spirit of grace. Oftentimes, as believers, we're weary because we haven't tapped into the spirit of grace. The spirit of grace will cause you to triumph in places where other people have failed. I'm going to say that again. The reason why we as believers are weary is because we have not tapped in to the spirit of grace. The spirit of grace will cause you to triumph where other people have failed. We were created to win in every area and every aspect of our lives. We were called forth to be successful. Our success exalts the king. Now, why would he not want you to be successful if he is looking for the souls of men? Come on here. We know that in business, testimonials, help a business to grow right okay okay so in a business if it is testimonials that help the business to grow and god knows all things why would he not want you to be a testimony in the earth realm come on jesus said i'm about my father's business what business was we was he in he was in the business of souls that's the business that I'm in. That's the business you should be in because the currency of the kingdom is souls. And if we can cause men to bow their knee to Jesus by directing them to the cross through our lives, we are helping to snatch souls back from the kingdom of darkness. I mean, just snatching them, bad boys, back from the kingdom of darkness because of the spirit of grace in our lives. We are talking about what God's grace looks like on the life of a believer. And so, um, God's grace is always going to point people back to God. You will know if somebody is operating in God's spirit or if they're operating um, out of their flesh or from darkness. Because whatever they do uh, will point to whoever they're trying to exalt. So, if the person is exalting Jesus Christ, the spirit of God should be at work in there. Uh, but you sometimes you, there's multi layers to it. But it's important to know that when we are operating for the king, we point people to the king. So the third scripture we're gonna go. First Peter two nine. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 2, 9. Light. So you're chosen. When you are chosen, that means that there was other options, but God picked you. All right. There were other options, but he picked you. You're a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation, a peculiar people. You're set apart. You're different. That you should show forth the praises of him. So your life should be a praise. When people look at you, they should be shouting and they should be happy and they should be full of joy because your life speaks to the glory of God, period. Now, Shateria, I done been through too much, so my life don't speak to the glory of God, ma'am. Your life could speak to the glory of God if you allowed it to. But oftentimes we frustrate the spirit of grace on our lives. And that's why we fail. What, what kind of uh, creator would create something to fail? You've never created something in your life for it to fail. If you're not as wise as a king of glory, why would he create something to fail? When he made you, he knew you were going to mess up. And so he made provisions for that mess up before the foundation of the world. That's why he sent his son to die for you. He knew you were going to mess up. He knew you were going to need a savior. He knew you were going to need direction. So that's why he sent the spirit of grace when his son ascended to his right hand. So, 
Because he knew this, he already made provision for you needing direction because God created you to be totally and completely dependent upon him. We're talking about what grace looks like in the life of a believer. And when we truly understand that grace is the empowerment of God on our lives, we know that we can do what God says we can do. Often we discount what God says because we haven't fully accepted that he's God. I know. Often we discount what God has said because we have not fully accepted that he is God. If we fully accept that he's God, that he's all-knowing, all-seeing, that he has our best interest at heart, that he is the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper, the light in the darkness, we wouldn't have as many struggles as we have. But because we make our problems our God, that means they eclipse or overshadow that of who the Almighty is in our eyes, not in reality, but we cause our reality to become fact in our lives, ignoring the truth. The truth says that you're more than a conqueror, but you allow the facts of your life to tell you who you were. I'm going to say that again. The truth said that you are more than a conqueror, but you have allowed the facts of your life to tell you that you can't win. See, back on Calvary, you won. People of God, I'm talking about what God's grace on the life of a believer looks like. It is his empowerment. It's, it's, it is him endowing you filling you with the ability to do what he's called you to do. No creator would make something with a purpose that it could not fulfill. All right. So you have a manufacturing company that makes bowls, right? So they make these bowls and the point of the bowl is to be able to hold liquid. It can only hold liquid up to a certain capacity and a certain amount of heat. And so what the manufacturer does is he takes this bowl and he ensures that it meets the specifications that he dreamed up. But then he takes this bowl through a series of tests and it, it melts in the process. He knows that he needs a different material to be able to get his creation, his bowl, to withstand the heat that's coming down the line. Okay, now hear me and hear me well. Because the manufacturer understands that he will profit if he gets this bowl to, 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 to um, be able to withstand a certain temperature and to carry a certain thing, he's going to do his very best to produce the best result, right? Now with God, there is no trial and error. With man, we got to figure out things. But when God made you, he made you with the ability to carry certain things. He made you with the ability to withstand certain things. And so to demonstrate to you that you can carry what he said you can carry, he's going to take you through the fire. Now hear me when I say this. Many fires are not started by God that we blame God about being in. I'm going to say this again. There are many fires that are not started by God, but we blame God for being in that fire. See, the manufacturer, once he makes the bowl and puts it on the shelf or display, somebody binds it and then they decide what they're going to make in that bowl, whether they're going to put the bowl inside of the oven or if they're going to put the bowl in the microwave. And so the temperatures will vary. But here's the great thing. Because the manufacturer anticipated that this was what this person was going to do, he ensured in the quality um, control process that this bowl would be able to withstand whatever level of heat or temperature it goes in. If it cannot withstand it, there will be a disclaimer, a warning, a notification on the box saying, do not put this in a temperature higher than that. That's the grace of God on your life. The grace of God empowers you and gives you the ability to withstand some heat that's coming. See, God is not going to give you more than you can handle. And what people don't get is that his spirit is the one that strengthens you. You're bending and, 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 and bowing because you haven't tapped into the spirit of grace. 
Listen, there is a warning label on your life. There's a label that tells you what you can withstand, how you can withstand it. If you read the word of God, you just got to read it. It's, it's, it's here. Just read it. Get your Bible. Where's your Bible at, people? Did you get your Bible with me? Okay. All right. So, we know in 1 Peter that it says that. So, so what does grace look like in the life of the believer? So, since you're able to stand on and in what would generally devour others, it will cause them to look to your God. We are going to go visit one of my favorite prophets. And his name is Daniel. I love this man of God. Daniel 6, 16 through 28. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel, and the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lions' mouths, that they have not hurt me, for as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then was the king exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no hurt and no manner of hurt was found upon him because he believed in his God. And the king commanded and they brought those men which had accused Daniel and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children and their wives, and the lions had the mastery of them and break all their bones in pieces or ever they came at the bottom of the den. Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever and his kingdom that was shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth, and he worketh signs and miracles in heaven and in earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Daniel 6, 16 through 28. All right. So the empowerment of God, the grace of God on your life will always point the people who are looking at you, those onlookers, back to God. And so that was evident in the life of Daniel. Daniel 3, 13 through 30. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackba, psaltery, and dusimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. 
But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, and the furnace exceeding hot, the flames of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, did not we cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, true, O king. He answered and said, lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt and the form of the fourth is like the son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the most high God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together, saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was an hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who have sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any God except their own God. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language would speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Daniel 3, 13 through 30. So obviously they didn't know God as Jesus back then because he didn't come in the flesh. But this is the divine empowerment, the grace of God on the life of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What burned up the three men that were sent forth to throw them in the fire. And these were mighty men out of the army. What burnt them up? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego danced in. I mean, what are you dancing in in your life? What lion's den have you been thrown in and people thought you were going to be battered and bruised and beaten, but you are standing or you're sleeping in the midst of the lion's den? I'm just saying. The grace of God on our lives empowers us to do what other people cannot do because we are tapped into the divine nature of the living God. Um, so the trials that you go through in your life are like the lion's den and the fiery furnace. But what's, what's great is God has promised to be with you. He said he's never going to leave you nor forsake you. And after your trial, you will be promoted. After both of these trials... They were promoted. After Jesus went through his trial, he was promoted. God wants to promote us. When the, um, when the people with the talents were faithful over their stuff, God promoted them. He's a God of promotion, but we have to walk with him through the test. And we have to walk with him through those things that want to devour us because we're able to show ourselves faithful. God is a God of promotion. That is why he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Because he wants to give to you. He wants to grow you. He wants to flourish you. 
But he will only do that when you have honored him. Do not frustrate the spirit of grace on your life. Grace is the divine empowerment of God operating in your life. We're going to go to my sixth scripture. Isaiah 43, 1 through 2. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Isaiah 43, 1 through 2. So God is making his promise to the people of God, telling them, all right, some waters are going to come against you and there's going to be some fire that comes against you, but I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you in it. That is God's grace on your life, the ability to go through trials and tribulations. See, sometimes we feel like we are all alone in this world. But the word of God tells us he'll never leave us nor forsake us. We're coming up on Resurrection Sunday. And one of the last words that Jesus spoke was, Eli, Eli, Yaksha, Maba. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That is what it was being interpreted as. And he was forsaken so that we'd never have to be forsaken. That means we're never abandoned. God will never abandon you. Yes. You were abused, and yes, you were mistreated, and yes, your heart has been broken. But God was there with you, and as he was speaking to you, he was speaking to you from the place of a father's heart, and he wanted you to know how much he cared about you. But because you had the voice of the world in your ears, you couldn't hear him. It is so important to know that God only wants you to be broken by him, not by the things of the world. When we're broken by God, it's a place where we can be remade into his image. Often, we allow the things that should not break us to break us. So that when God comes along to reform us and reshape us, we're unable to take on the mold of the master. I'm talking about... Uh, what God's grace looks like on the life of a believer. It is his empowerment, his ability for you to rise above your situation. It's the ability for you to stand in the midst of what kills another person. But when we frustrate the grace of God, when we don't allow him to refine us after we've been abused, when we don't allow him to restructure us after we have been abandoned, when we don't allow him to step in and, and give us a clean heart, a new heart, we frustrate his grace on our lives because he wants us to walk on water and we're just trying to swim in it. Grace of God on your life makes you makes what you go through look easy to those around you. So have, have you ever been around somebody who was going through something and you're like, it doesn't even look like they're going through anything. That's the empowerment of God on their lives. Um, when people go through trials and tribulations and they're not shaken, it's because they're rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ. You have got to have a firm foundation of trust in Jesus Christ in order to weather the storms of life that are going to come. The word of God tells us that more, man that is born of a woman is but a few days and he will have trials. So there's an expectation there that you're going to have storms. It tells us in the word of God that if we suffer with Christ, we can reign with him. And so when you have the empowerment of God on your life, the grace of God on your life, the spirit of God operating in your life, you make living your life look easy. And that's when people are like, oh, I want what that person has because they make it look easy. Listen. It is the grace of God on the life of that person that makes what they're going through look like a cakewalk. You never want to covet the life of another person because you don't know what they're going through. They were carefully crafted for the trials and tribulations that they are enduring because the maker, the creator, knew what he wanted to get out of them. 
What God wants to get out of me and what God wants to get out of you are two different things. So the grace, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that works through me is going to be different than the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that makes or works through you. Neither one of the graces on our lives is better than the other. As it's both the Holy Spirit. I mean, and the Holy Spirit is fantastic. He is all that. Okay, he's great. So you can't compare the grace on your life to the grace on my life. And I can't compare the grace on my life to the grace on your life. Or we'll be stuck in this place of comparison, which there's no rivalry in the kingdom of God because there's no scarcity in the kingdom of God because we live from a place of abundance, which means we don't live in a place of competition or comparison. So the grace of God on your life makes what you makes what you do look easy to those around you. You're not crushed under the weight because you were produced by God to be able to endure that particular trial. You know, when companies send out those pre-qualification letters of credit, they say, oh, you're pre-qualified based on this pre-screening process that we've gone through. You're pre-qualified for this. That's the same thing in God. He will pre-qualify you for the trials, but it's up to you to tap in and access that, right? Because there's some steps you have to take once you get a pre-qualification letter. Yeah, they go in and they take a look at your credentials. Ma'am, did you pay? Did you pay your rent on time? Did you pay this? Did you do this? If not, they're going to disqualify you. The same is, is, is true in, in this walk with God. He's going to come through and he's going to say, okay, were you faithful in this area? Were you faithful over here? Were you doing this? Are you depending on me in this area? That's how we qualify for the things of God. You don't have to qualify to be saved, but you do have to qualify for the rewards that he wants to give you. And you can only qualify by allowing the spirit of grace to rise up on the inside of you so you can do those things that you could not do without God. God wants you to live a life totally and completely dependent on him. We are talking about what the grace of God looks like in the life of a believer. So I got some more scriptures here for us to take a look at. Scripture number 7, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 through 14. There have no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, free, flee from idolatry. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 through 14. Oftentimes as Christians will say that phrase, God won't give you no more than you can bear. Okay, but what, what else does it say? It's the grace of God, the ability of God for you to flee, to resist it, to get out of it. He's giving you the strength to overcome it. But often we say that with our sad, sappy voices. God is not raising punks. I know. He's not. He's raising, raising mighty men and women in, women in the earth realm. And I want to be a mighty warrior for the king. I don't want to be the, the kind of person who uh, went through life and was unable to reap the benefit and reap the harvest that Jesus Christ died for me to have. I want it all. There is not going to be one blessing in the unclaimed blessing room with Shakira Jones's name on it. No, thank you. I'm getting everything that God has for me because I'm going to allow the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to work through me in this life. All right. Scripture number eight. Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Philippians 4, 13. So that's the truth of God's word. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. That is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit on your life. But the question is, will you? I know. It's, it's no, more, no longer a, a, a matter of can you. The fact is, will you allow the Holy Spirit to empower you? Or will you fight against what God wants to do in your life? Often we are fighting God and we think we're fighting the enemy. 
I'm going to say that again. Often we are fighting God when we think we're fighting the enemy. It is the plot, plan, and scheme of the enemy to get you confused. It is the plot, plan, and scheme of the enemy to cause you not to properly hear the voice of God. If he can pervert your hearing and he can pervert your um, sight, he can destroy your life. That is why the word of God tells us to guard our eye gates and to guard our ear gates. What are you allowing to enter into you through what you see and what you hear? The things that are entering into you through what you see and what you hear are destroying your destiny. They are causing you not to allow the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you because they're exalting you in your own eyes. You are watching the things of the world and then you're telling yourself, that you're more than God. And you're doing it subconsciously, but you're doing it nonetheless. We are talking about allowing God's grace, the Holy Spirit to rise up inside of you to allow you to live the life that God called you to live. But oftentimes we live lives, lives below the standard of God and then we get mad at God because of a decision that we've made. You've decided to live below what God has for you. There was a point in my life where I decided to live below what God had for me. He had to say, ma'am, I called you to triumph. I have called you to rule and reign. So I'm going to need you to get off the floor and fix your crown. Honey, get up, wipe your face, and come sit next to me and Jesus. I was like, oh, okay. That, that's my chair? It's pretty, Dad. Ooh, look at all these jewels. But I couldn't see all of that while I was on the floor wallowing in my mess. He was, he was raising me up and I was trying to stay down. Listen, he is such a good God that he equips you with everything you need for the journey. Listen, so he had, I, I try to walk almost every day. And so I was walking past the school and they have a, um, place where the food is made and like I don't even know what it's called but the children don't leave the school to go and get the food the food is brought from the, the food service building to the students I'm gonna say that again the students do not leave the school to get their lunch the lunch is brought to them if a student needs something they have access to it at the school. If a school will stock its students with what it needs, how much more will the, the, the king of glory stock you with the things that you need? I'm talking about grace, God's grace on your life. The grace, the empowerment of God in the life of a believer. Romans 15, 5. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. Romans 15, five. The spirit of God gives you the abilities that you didn't know that you had. He gives you the abilities to overcome. He gives you the ability to look past some things. Sometimes we're leaning on our own understanding and we're not leaning on God to address a situation. And that's why we're overcome by that thing. We're talking about God's grace. What does God's grace look like on the life of a believer? James 1, 25. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. James 1, 25. The Spirit of God made us free. We can look into the Spirit of God to build us up. We can look into the Spirit of God to overcome. We can look to the Spirit of God to be successful. And so... We don't just hear the word of God, but then we go out and do it through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the grace of God on the life of a believer. Romans 15, 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Romans 15, 13. We got the Holy Ghost. We forgot that he had power. 
Listen, I want all the power of the Holy Ghost. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is on the inside of me. That means I have resurrection power living in me. Okay? That means I can say Lazarus come forth and Lazarus has to come forth. I'm talking about the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. All right. The last verse of scripture. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews 12, 2. See, often we forget that Jesus Christ was 100% God, but 100% man. And so when he was going to Calvary, he was emotionally distressed. But he didn't think about what he was dealing with at that moment. He thought about the glory that was to come because in his heart and in his mind, he knew that the pain and suffering he was going to endure was just for a moment. And so the spirit of grace empowered him to go forward to do the work of God. That trial, that pain, that suffering that you're going through is but a moment in the grand scheme of things. And you can tap into the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, the grace of God on your life so that you can make that thing look easy because you're allowing the Holy Spirit to shoulder the burden. The, the secret to that is for you not to carry anything. I'm going to say it again. The secret to allowing the Holy Spirit to empower you, the grace of God to rise up in you, is for you not to carry your burdens. You just give them to God. You say, here you go, Daddy God. You can have this because I don't really want it anyway. And you go about your business. And if it tries to come back up in your mind, you say, oh, no, thank you. I gave that to my dad already. I don't want it. My daughter never comes to me and asks me how many pamper, if, if there are, if we need to buy more Pampers. She never says, oh, do you need any help buying food, mom? No, because that's none of her concern. I am the parent, right? That should be the same thing in the life of the believer. It ain't none of your business about the problems of this world. You better give them to your dad because it's none of your concern. If we get to a place where we mind our business and do what the Lord told us to do, we can allow the Holy Ghost to work through us. I'm talking about the grace of God, the empowerment, the ability of God to do in us what we cannot do for ourselves. Powerful woman, I pray that this video has blessed you in a new way today and that you are able to see how God's divine empowerment is even working in your life today. That it has given you language for what is going on in your life so that you are able to live life abundantly as you have been called forth to live. Listen, if this has blessed you or has opened your understanding in any way, comment down below. I would love to hear from you. I will see you in another video. Bye.